It's that time again. Welcome back to another episode of the Racing Writers Podcast. I'm your host, Kelly Crandall. A fun episode. I know, I say that all the time, but this is fun. So a fun episode again leading into the Daytona 500. My guest today is the director of the ISC Archives and Research Center here in Daytona Beach, Florida, Mr. Herb Branham. Herb is a wonderful friend, a wonderful human being, and does a wonderful job over at the Speedway as well as the archives, and I really felt the need to talk to Herb this week as we go into the 60th annual Daytona 500 because, you know, Herb's written some books, I'm a big fan of his, but this is Daytona, this is the Daytona 500, the biggest race of the year, and for somebody like Herb, who has such a storied history and a very awesome background, I felt like there's nobody better to talk to in preparation of our biggest race than Herb Branham. So Herb is the guest today. A little bit of background on Herb. He is a graduate of the University of South Florida in Tampa. For 21 years, he was a reporter with the Tampa Tribune, made his way into NASCAR, as you will hear, kind of a fun story. He worked in NASCAR IMC, NASCAR Communications, for 14 years. And for the last few, he has been working again at the NASCAR archives in Daytona Beach, Florida, which is a very nondescript building that many of you probably don't even know about. It sits kind of away from the speedway, down a couple blocks, where anybody who's come to the racetrack and has picked up credentials, it's actually over there. It's just, you really don't know it's there unless you get the chance to go over there and see it. So Herb is an author. He's a wonderful, wonderful writer. Uh, You will hear me say in the podcast, I can't recommend his books enough, and I firmly hold true by that. So I don't want to ramble too long because I really think you'll enjoy this episode. My apologies for a little bit of the audio levels and the quality. I was, I got to be honest, I was not well prepared for my interview. I was prepared to talk to Herb. I was not prepared with my equipment. Just, it's been a rough week for me, as some of you may know. And I just, when I was packing, I didn't do a good job packing and I left my normal microphones. So this is not a reflection on Herb. Herb is great. It's a reflection on me. I apologize for the poor audio. I hope you will enjoy and just, you know, perk your ears up a little bit more because, you know, you want to be able to hear what he's saying, but I think you'll also be very interested in what he's saying. So it's a reason for you guys to really dig into this episode and I hope you enjoy it. We recorded this on Thursday, February 15th here in Daytona, right before I went over to the racetrack ahead of three practice sessions for the Camping World Truck Series and the Can-Am Duels. And we have set the field now for the Daytona 500. And actually, you're going to hear Herb make his prediction for the Daytona 500. And it was somebody who was very successful in his dual race. So let's keep that in mind. But again, I don't want to ramble too long. Once again, uh, thank you for the continued ratings, reviews. I hope you are subscribing. I hope you are leaving reviews and ratings. If not, please do. So without any further ado, let's get to the show. Let's get to the conversation. I hope you find it fascinating. And once again, thanks to Herb Branham for being my guest on the Racing Writers Podcast. Here we go. Well, it's Daytona 500 week, so of course one of my first things I thought of when coming to Daytona was the Speedway, but also the IFC archives, which I've had the pleasure of seeing a few times, and Mr. Herb Branham is the man behind the magic over here. So I said I have to come talk to her because you have quite a background yourself, and I'm sure plenty of stories. And one of the main reasons, as I told Herb when I pitched this and he agreed, was I just finished one of your books, the Bill French Jr., The Man Who Made NASCAR. So, uh, Herb, let's start with your books. You've written five, I believe. I've read The Bill Jr. and Big Bill Sr. And I want to give you a chance not only to just talk about them, but I want to preface it by saying that one of the things I really enjoyed about both of those books was how vivid they were. So first off, uh, congratulations on five wonderful books. But when it comes to the Big Bill Sr. book, as well as Bill Jr., kind of just walk me through the process of how how you made both of those books come to life. Because again, they were so vivid as if you were right there through every single event that you touched on. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for those good words and, and welcome to the lair here we're in the we're in the lair we're in the ISC archives and research center. Both of those books, I think, and I've had I've had a, a number of people, you know, say what you're saying about those books, and and you know, my attempt was really to just try to make them kind of conversational, 
and a lot of storytelling and that sort of thing. And, and that's just, I think that's just kind of the way, you know, I do things. Um, you know, being a longtime newspaper reporter, I always wanted to be a columnist, and I, I wasn't. And I remember when I covered auto racing and other sports for years, a lot of times my uh, game stories would would read like columns. I had to go back and make sure I put the score in because I was too busy <laughs> trying to pretend I was a columnist, I guess. But, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, when you have that kind of material, it's kind of, uh, it, it should come to life. And on both of those books, what I tried to do was just avoid getting into the weeds uh, too much. Uh, you know, it, like, for instance, in the Bill Sr. book, which was published uh, a couple years ago, I have a section in the back which has all kinds of statistics and everything, and so I, that that happened while Bill France Senior was alive. That's in the back of the book if you want to look at that fine. I didn't want to muddy up the waters, and it was the same way in the Bill Junior book. I just tried really to let the stories tell themselves. And when you have such great stories, such as Bill France Junior calling a uh, a penalty on a driver while he's out in a boat in the Atlantic with Felix Sabatis watching the race by satellite like a dish mm -hmm. and he calls back to Darlington and calls a penalty on a driver and uh, you know, how could you mess that up? <laughs> you mentioned the material and uh, actually that was one of the most uh, f the funniest things I think I read in the book along with the fact uh, you touched on Bill French Jr.'s relationship with the media and kind of the give and take that there was there. And one of the stories you touched on was how he came in and uh, he gave everybody sugar daddies uh, in the media center one time as he was kind of goofing off with them about how, you know, we don't need you, you need us type thing. And, and I got a kick out of that. But you did mention the material. And you worked for NASCAR in the communications department for a few years. You, you knew the Francis. Did that make these books easier, the fact that you can also pull on kind of first-hand experience in knowing both of the Francis? Yeah, and um, I, I was really lucky. I worked at NASCAR. I still work uh, for the NASCAR mm -hmm. Foundation, in addition to working for Daytona International Speedway, but I worked solely for NASCAR for uh, 14 years, and I was really lucky. Um, I was able to work directly with Bill France Jr. for the last six years of his life, and it all got started. Um, oddly enough, uh, Bill was a supporter of uh, local politicians and he got me involved in the campaigns and producing materials for the candidates you know kind of you know kind of under the radar <laughs> you know I remember we uh, we uh, uh, people I was working with at Bill's behest we produced a uh, fake uh, newspaper that looked somewhat like the local paper that was promoting these candidates so I started to do all that and Bill France Jr. just kind of brought me in and I wrote all of his speeches and ha handled his public appearances the last six years of his life. Kind of made it pretty easy when it came time to write a book. And then also what we did with the Bill Jr. book is we, we solicited individual stories from different people and uh, they were great stories. So once again, when you have that kind of material, it, it makes it easy. But my personal um, relationship with Bill France Jr. and his wife Betty Jane made that book fairly easy, I guess you could say, to write just because I was kind of, you know, right there in the middle of it. And then that kind of transferred when I did the Bill Sr. book. Um, you know, I got a lot of help from Jim Foster, who had actually, and I reference this in the book, he had started a manuscript years ago. He'd only gotten like about three chapters into it. But yeah, he let me uh, use that, and then he had a lot of research materials he gave me. And then, you know, once again, when you're you're uh, when you spend so much time, or, you know, around the family members, it's kind of by osmosis that you that you, you just kind of learn more and more about them. Again, I can't recommend both books enough. I mean, I read Big Bill first a couple years ago. I remember that's how you and I met when the book had come out. It was I just could not believe again just how vivid it was. It was like I was sitting right there. It's such a history lesson. <laughs> and then Bill France Jr., the man who made NASCAR, I read just I believe two weeks ago, right before I had contacted you. 
when I think of, and I'm sure many people have ways they would sum up both Bill French Jr. and Big Bill, as as we all love to call him. You know, Big Bill was, you know, very focused and determined of not only creating NASCAR, but the way he ran it and, and building tracks and, and things of that nature. And Bill French Jr. was just as focused, but he also had such a broader mind when it came to, you know, expanding it. How how do you like to remember both Big Bill and Bill? Well, you know, and I've had so many people uh, tell me this, and I've also read it. It's almost like the same description about the two. Bill France Sr. was not really big on uh, on listening <laughs> uh, to people. Uh, you know, he might, but he, he really was, you know, eh, we're going to do it this way by God, and that's it. And if you don't like it, you can get the hell out of this deal. That's senior. Bill Jr. was a big, big listener. But typically he would he would listen and give everybody their due, but then he, he usually went with his own decision. But but he would take input. Big difference. You know, I, from what I've been told, Bill Sr., you know, wouldn't even bother. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he knew what he wanted to do. And guess what? I think he knew what he was doing. <laughs> that, that dictatorship everybody yeah. likes to throw around. Yes, and it was. But, uh... Uh, you know, it was needed. It, it really was. Some, If you didn't have that, uh, the whole thing would have never gotten started. I mean, somebody had to grab grab this sport and shake it and, and get it in line. And it needed a dictatorship to do it because it hadn't worked. And, you know, there were so many fragmented organizations. And, and before NASCAR, you know, Bill Sr. Had, his, had another organization that he had for a couple of years. And it was just one of many. And you needed a strong personality and somebody that was going to really rule the roost. And and boy, I'll tell you, he uh, he ex- he stepped on the on the gas immediately, and it just kept going, going, and going, and uh, uh, it, it's still going today. You know, because of, of Bill Senior, but Bill Junior came along at the perfect time. You know, things were changing. You know, that hard, hard line dictatorship approach was probably not going to continue to work uh, forever. And it was in the early 70s, and Winston did come aboard, big money. Corporate America was really starting to, to notice this thing more and more. And it needed, a, you know, it maybe needed a little fresher look. And, uh, and, it, and it came at just the right time. A lot of people say the same thing happened when Brian took over in 2004. Uh, you know, that was the year that the sponsorship changed from Winston to Nextel, which turned into Sprint. We had a new fuel supplier. And uh, you know, once again, it was it was you know it was time for maybe a fresh look at things. It's funny how it's all worked out. But I, but I would just say, Bill Senior and Bill Junior were just the right people at the right time. Of course, it's Daytona 500 week. This is such a beautiful racetrack. It's changed so much over the years. Mm-hmm. But this was certainly Big Bill's baby. Absolutely. You know, back when when he built this. What do you think? Certainly, Big Bill, but. But Bill Jr. would think of what Daytona International Speedway has become today. Well, I think Bill France Sr. would love it. Mm-hmm. Bill Jr. would too, but Bill Jr. would be uh, uh, really worried about how much it cost. <laughs> Bill France Sr. was not a big, he was not a frugal guy. You know, he, there's a legendary stories about, you know, he even had to turn in expense accounts to, to his wife whenever he was on the road. And, and just like just like every employee, that sort of thing. But he was he was uh, he's been called you know a bit of a spendthrift. Whereas Bill Jr. was just you know he was thrifty. But they both love it. But I have to tell you, uh, God, that would be great to have Bill France Sr. around to see what this, because this is this is his vision. You know, uh, I mean, to even try to do this years ago. Joey Chitwood, the former president of the Speedway. Uh, tells a great story about his grandfather, Joey Chitwood. Uh, Joey Chitwood III, who was the president of Speedway, his grandfather was Joey Chitwood, who was a very accomplished racer, primarily in IndyCar, and he was a good friend of Bill France Sr., and and uh, apparently Joey Chitwood just told him it was the craziest idea he had ever had, it wasn't going to work, this is nuts, and now his grandson likes to remind people that his grandfather wasn't often wrong, but he was definitely wrong that time. Yeah. But it was a crazy concept, a lot of people thought. It was a big dream, big vision, and uh, they built it in 15 months, and you know, he borrowed a lot of money, paid up back everybody, I think, within 10 years or so, but paid everybody back. But you know, it was just really a, an unbelievable vision that they could put that thing together. 
And I think if he's, he was alive to see this today, he'd, he'd be ecstatic. How could he not be? Yeah. And what about, I mean, what about you, Herb? I mean, you've been here, of course, for many years. I want to touch on uh, the building that we are in. We, we mentioned it at the top, but kind of how did you, I get, did you stumble into NASCAR? I know you were a reporter with the Tampa Tribune for, I think, 21 years. Right. Were you a, a general sports guy, or kind of how did you find your way into NASCAR? Because now you've made quite a niche here. When I tell people this story, I think, Sometimes people think I'm making it up because it sounds like it could be made up, but it's really not. I'm from Indianapolis, and we used to live right out by the Speedway. So I always kind of, you know, uh, knew about racing. I, I liked the Indy 500 and that kind of thing. And my first job right out of college working for the Tampa Tribune, which at the time was one of the 20 biggest papers in the country. It was, you know, I was right out of college. It was a big deal. I got sent to Sebring, where our office in Sebring, and I remember... My boss, the great Tom McEwen, told me he sold Sebring with two things, clean air and there's this big race. <laughs> and I had heard of the 12 hours of Sebring, but I, you know, I didn't know it. So then, you know, all, all of a sudden I'm immersed in, uh, in this race every year, which consumed the whole town. And, I, and then I started helping the guy who covered auto racing. I started coming over here to Daytona. And uh, for a long time, I didn't really think much of NASCAR. I was, I was more uh, in tune with the sports car guys. I think that was a, a extension of Indy cars being part of my sensibility when I was really young. And you know, NASCAR, I thought, oh yeah, I was like a lot of yeah, going around circles, that kind of thing. And uh, then I came over here, and uh, I really saw, you know. And I remember I, I had a guy I worked with, Tom Ford, Tribune. He would he would tell me. Uh, before we would go to the, we'd watch the IROC race. That was the old series which matched people in different disciplines. And the very first one, you know, it was just like in 83, and I said something about the sports car guys, you know, being, you know, really great and all that. And he turned to me and goes, yeah, but they're not as good as these guys. You watch. And he was right. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing against the sports car guys, but on the high banks of Daytona, no, they weren't. And, uh, and it wasn't long before the, the NASCAR thing just really, you know, took hold with me. The personalities, the, you know, the daring, the courage to do it, you know, and uh, especially here at Daytona. It takes, you know, it takes more than skill. You can have all the skill in the world, but, you, you know, you, you've got to have nerves of absolute steel to do that here. And uh, so, you know, I started, started really, really... Uh, getting into this this thing and saw it was much more than guys going around in a circle and and it was also as entertaining off the track as it was on the track and I just I just thought it was magical mm -hmm. and uh, Tom Brokaw the famous newsman who Bill France jr. introduced me to I was lucky enough to, been lucky enough to get to know him uh, he calls it a NASCAR the greatest American sport <laughs> <laughs> And then 14 or so years with NASCAR, I believe you said. Right. And now you are, I, again, I call you like the gatekeeper over here at the archive. Just kind of walk everybody through what your job entails and, and kind of what this building means. If I understand correctly, it's not exactly open to the public, but there are ways for folks to see it. So if you just want to go through, again, kind of how you ended up here and, and sure. your day-to-day -day activities. Yeah, well, Joey Chitwood, the president of Speedway, uh, brought me over. The people who had worked there previously uh, were retiring and uh, talked to me about the job, and and I talked to him about it, and, and, and you know, it was just kind of in process, and the next day, Joey, uh, without really letting me know, called me back and goes, hey, we're all set. <laughs> he had already gone to NASCAR, and uh, I said, what do you mean we're all set? He goes, we're all set, and uh, you, you can, when can you start? Like, it started like four days later over here. Yeah, this place primarily it's a research facility for photography research for the motorsports industry, teams, tracks, corporate sponsors, partners, media, a lot of media requests. But several times a week, it's part of the uh, Daytona International Speedway VIP tour. We bring tour groups over here, and uh, they're able to they purchase a ticket at the Ticket and Tours building, and they get to come here. Then they go all through the new stadium, and then they go to the Motorsports Hall of Fame of America, which is over at the Ticket and Tours building. And it, it's a heck of a heck of a, a tour. It takes like almost four hours, and and they see so much wonderful stuff. And most people think this place is pretty wonderful. And uh, yeah, and I do too. Uh, we've been very lucky 
you know, with our artifacts and, and photos and trophies that we have here that have been donated or just belong to ISC. It, it's not that hard to make something look good when you when you have this. It's kind of like the stories with the books. When you have, like, unbelievably great stories and, and, and characters, it's inherent to the whole thing. You know, it's not as hard as some people might think to put it all together and display it. I mean, you know, I had a, a, a guy who used to work here, and he came by, and he goes, my God, look at this. Did you hire a professional designer? And I told him, no, I just hung up some great pictures. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and they are. I mean, and you know, we have, for your listeners here, they come in and they see, when you come here, you see displays about all the, uh, the big races at Daytona, the 500, the 400, the Rolex 24, and the motorcycle racing. We have a great display. Probably the thing we're most proud of is a true-to-life recreation of uh, Big Bill's office. It's all his original office items, and uh, once again, you, you know, you have all that, and it'd be pretty hard to mess that up. You couldn't if you tried. Yeah. And the uh, guy from our operations department, we got the old paneling, and he made it look exactly like it used to look, but then all the contents, his desk, his chair, his books, including autograph books to him from people like Enzo Ferrari makes it fun but it it, it 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 is not hard to showcase that kind of stuff and have it not it, it'd be hard to, to mess it up as I said and then we also have a library with all kinds of reference materials uh, we have an area called Earnhardt Corner which fans love most of the items in there were donated by a, a family that had come to one of our tours we have our own garage with you know some great great cars including the car that won the 500 in 1961 Marvin Pants drove it and uh, you know it just kind of goes on and on and uh, it's it's whenever people come here they you know they, they stay here for about an hour most of the people don't want to leave right away yeah. when the first time I came here I had no idea it existed and I walked in and I just was blown away it was like for somebody like me who I consider myself such a still a geek of this sport walking in here it was like a treasure trove mm -hmm. And you mention Bill Sr.'s office, the, the recreation of the office with all of his, per, like that was his personal artifacts and memorabilia yeah. and stuff. I, I still, that is to me probably the coolest thing in here. I mean, you have plenty of cool things in here, but just seeing that come to life yeah. what it is so amazing. Do you have certain things that you still walk around, Herb, and you see and just kind of smile and say, that's pretty cool that we have that? And I start, you know, with the office and, you know, there's a great story behind that I, I've had a number of people tell me uh, or they say well this is wonderful but why would you still have all this pretty good question <laughs> and uh, and there's a great story behind it years ago when Bill France senior toward the latter part of his life he had Alzheimer's and as it worsened uh, eventually obviously he could not help Bill jr. run NASCAR anymore he, you know he was he was in decline but not that much decline because his sons had all of his office materials, what you see here at the facility, moved to another office space in Daytona. And they recreated what he had over at the Speedway on the second floor of this Tick and Tours building. They recreated his office for him. And so for years there, in his latter years, as long as he could, and I think it was almost until the end, he continued to get dressed every morning and go to work. And he went into his office, and uh, he would take phone calls from people. People would, of course, come by to visit, especially during the race weeks. And uh, the whole thing was he was, as Jim France said, he could still be, you know, Bill France Sr. Mm -hmm. And he had his dignity about him. And, and uh, one of the things Jim has told me is that, you know, while the disease continued to advance, he didn't really have a, a, an accompanying decline in, in dignity, which sometimes accompanies that. Uh, he was really able to, you know, still be himself. And, and you have to think that that office setting that he was able to go to for all those years and be in familiar surroundings, it had to help. And it's a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful story. You know? yeah. so, so that's how, why we have all this stuff. After he died, it was put into storage. And then there was a there was another recreation at another facility owned by ISC. Uh, it was kind of just like a General France room. It wasn't really the office. So when I came over here four years ago, I just knew what I wanted to do. We had all of the, all of the office belongings in a cage back here in our warehouse, and I said I know what I want to do. And uh, 
and we did it, and it turned out pretty nice. You mentioned Earnhardt Corner, and ironically enough, we are recording on February 15th, which is the 20-year anniversary since Dale Sr. won his first and only, of course, very memorable Daytona 500. For you, Herb, is there a way to sum up what Dale Earnhardt and that Earnhardt name mean to Daytona and just this this town, this race, this racetrack? Do you ever think about that in particular, kind of what it means even to you? Yeah, sure. Every every Almost every tour, uh, when I see fans go over there and I've had a few of them actually break down and cry. Wow. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I don't I don't think you can really uh, describe it. Uh, it, it. It's an unreal well of emotion and, and awe about the Earnhardts and you know one thing I've always found interesting you know after Earnhardt's uh, death you know everybody loved him of course when he raced everybody either loved him or loved to hate him. I mean, it was between him and Jeff Gordon. It was almost like they were the two most popular and the two most hated. Now, you know, with the, his passing and then the passage of time, and here at Daytona especially, because keep in mind, he only won the 500 once. He had an incredible bad string of luck. He should have won it at least three other times. I mean, the one year he's leading on the last lap, a seagull goes into the front of his car. and I mean, who has that happen? And... Uh, but he, he won 34 races here overall, which are more than anybody else. So, you know what I'm saying. He was clearly the, the best racer in the history of the Speedway. He just had some bad luck, or he would have won a lot more 500s. One last thing about the archives here. Is there, this may be a broad question, it may be a silly question, but for somebody like me again who just, it's so cool to me. Is there a better place to work? I mean, how cool is it what you get to do every day and just not only be here in Daytona, which is, again, such a special place, but this is this is such a magical building, and you talked about it, just all this, all the artifacts that have been able to be preserved over the years. I mean, do you do you kind of experience that cool factor with this job? Yeah, sure, it's nice. I mean, and, and getting back to the tours, it's wonderful to see grown men and women come in and act like kids. I mean, it really is. I had a guy <laughs> a few weeks ago, I come around the corner and he's trying to climb into one of the race cars. He was a British guy and he liked Malcolm Campbell. We have a Bluebird replica. I think the guy had been to the local pub before he had come to the tour and he and I came around the corner. I stopped him just in time or he was going to get, the, and I, if we'd gotten him in, if he'd gotten in, I don't know how we would have gotten him out. He would have gotten stuck because that Bluebird is so, so small. But, it, you know, and, and at first he was upset, and then I immediately, within seconds, I go, oh, this is great, because I'll be able to tell this story to people. And I, I always, with our tour guests, before we start, I say, and there's one more thing I have to tell you, you're not allowed to climb in the race cars, and I tell that story. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but it's great to see people react uh, uh, to, all, to all the items, and because there's so many memories that all this, you know, evokes for people. And then, and then you have uh, you have situations like yesterday. Oh, oh the, my! All right, my uh, my portable speaker there just went off. Everybody, we had a had a woman come in, and she starts telling me that her father was on Janet Guthrie's uh, crew here when she, Janet Guthrie raced in the 500 in, in 76, uh, 77, and uh, and she goes, "Do you think you might have any pictures?" And, I said, well, what did he do? And she said, he was the gas gas can guy. I said, we can look. And so I pull out our, our Janet Guthrie file, and right away this woman is looking at like three or four pictures of her dad. And and I've got getting those printed for her, and, and she purchased those. And uh, it was unbelievable. I mean, she just, you know, just on a whim, she would have never thought that we had had those. And we opened the file, and there they were. She was staring at pictures of her father who has passed away. It was a big moment for her. You have been here for so long. You have seen and experienced and probably been a part of so many Daytona 500 memories or just things with this Speedway. What are some of the favorite in particular that you like to call upon that you personally experienced? Either you, you covered it or you were a part of it or you witnessed it of just being here in Daytona. Yeah, without a doubt, 89, the uh, Firecracker 400. Now that's a Coca-Cola 400. Uh, Davey Allison won. And his father, Bobby, accompanied us to a press box. In 88, Bobby Allison had had the real bad accident at Pocono. 
which he, you know, nearly he nearly died, and uh, his memory was virtually, you know, gone. Everything. And Davy come up, came up there and started talking to the media and telling us about how he was trying to help his dad, in effect, like rebuild his memory banks, giving him new memories. It was an unbelievable day. I mean, get chills just thinking about it. <laughs> and to just see, you know, Davy talk about his father in that way and, uh, in effect, give, you know, this, this victory. And any really anything he was doing on the racetrack was becoming almost a tribute to his dad to help his dad have new memories. Yeah, that's probably my favorite favorite time. Then, obviously, whenever uh, I wasn't here when Dale Sr. won, I was uh, no longer covering racing at that time. Somebody else uh, was doing it. And I remember I, I'd kind of given up on Dale Sr. ever winning the 500. I, when I, I, wasn't, I don't even think I watched the race that day. And when I found out it happened, I couldn't believe it. But, um, you know, to see his son win here... Uh, in July 2001, and then the 500 and 04 and 14. I remember after the 14 victory, I believe it was Jeff Gordon that was quoted as saying, "All is right in the world tonight," because uh, Earnhardt won the 500. <laughs> yeah, so th th those are probably the, you know the, the two junior wins. But number one for me is 89, Davy winning the July race. Has there ever been a Daytona 500 winner or maybe a race that you just look back and go, I can't believe that happened. You know, there's been so many. It had to be uh, Derek Cope when he inherited yeah. the lead because Earnhardt cut a tire going into turn three, and here came, you know, this 10 car down on the inside. He was going to have a good run. He's going to finish third, and uh, probably. And all of a sudden, Derek Cope wins the five. Who is this guy? And I remember I was a depressed doctor. I go, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> Everybody was scrambling, you know, with the media guide, and you know, we didn't have the internet then where we could we could research. We we were in trouble because everybody was already writing the Earnhardt. You know, everybody was at least a few paragraphs in their story probably, and then we had to we had to recast, and everybody was freaking out. Who is Derek Cope, and how are we going to tell this? You know, we we don't know anything about this guy, and then what, what a great story. And he only won once more. I believe he won at Dover later that season. And uh, and then, you know, kind of became like, a, I guess what you'd call a journeyman racer and still, you know, enters races from time to time. But, boy, what a great day that was for him. And it was cool for the sport. Yeah. And it got a lot of notoriety, you know, Earnhardt failing again. You know, I think, I think a lot of people had just said, uh, this is never going to happen. And uh, it's just never going to happen. And a guy named Derek Cope won in the Great American Race. I, it is one of those races where, like you said, you, you you look back at the time and you're probably wondering, like, what was it like? You know, you just described the, you know, what the media was doing. I can't imagine what the rest of America was doing of, oh, my goodness, you know, who who is this guy and how could this again happen was, to Dale Earnhardt? Yeah, I mean, how, really, how could it happen? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to look at some stats here. I think Earnhardt that day uh, led an unbelievable number of laps. Well, I mean, because Dale, every time he came down here, it wasn't just as if he found himself at the front. I mean, he normally dominated these races before something went wrong. Yeah, Earnhardt led 155 laps that day out of the 200. And uh, only to watch some guy named Derek Cope slide by him on the last lap. That, yeah, that was the heartbreak of heartbreaks. Uh, but that, 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 to me, was his most... Uh, unbelievable finish i think just yeah. to, just to see that so before i let you go i have to of course we have to look ahead to this weekend first off i'm curious do you do you still come to the races herb or how do you like to take in the daytona 500 and what will you be doing on sunday no i'll be uh during the uh the event weekends i do all of our press releases that go out and then obviously i work with the media and help out uh, andrew booth and dawn zinsmaster in the media center but I, I'll be in the press box. I work the press box, and I help the media up there. You know, when we do the post-race interviews and, and that sort of thing, relaying down to the down to the infield, we have questions, and then you know, just helping them during the event. And so that's where I'll be starting tonight for the uh, Can-Am duel, and then for the trucks and the Xfinity, and then uh, I'll be up there for the 500, just working the press box. So you will get to see another Daytona 500. It is the 60th annual. I don't know if you, like, I can't believe that. I mean, uh, does that strike a chord with you? Yeah, it sure does. I, you know, I have it. I don't know how many I've seen. You know, it's not, 
you know, I don't know, maybe 20, I guess, but uh, uh, yeah, 60. And, and to think it all it all started here in, in 1959 is incredible. And here we are, all yeah. these years later, that crazy idea, crazy idea turned out to be a pretty good one. So that crazy idea, we're going to do it for the 60th annual time on Sunday, so I have to put you on the spot with our last question. Looking ahead, do you have an early prediction maybe of what you think we're going to see on Sunday afternoon? Yeah, Chase Elliott. <laughs> That's uh, just because... Uh, God, I, I just, you know, I'm always, always thinking about the stories of what's good for the business. I'll uh, be quite honest. Uh, to me, that would just be unbelievable to finally see Bill Elliott's kid win win here. It's unbelievable he hasn't won a cup race yet when he was so so uh, great in Xfinity. He's just had a lot of bad luck, you know. And uh, But to me, that would just be a wonderful story to see uh, Chase Elliott uh, win the Daytona 500. Well, Herb, I thank you so much, and I will keep that in mind, and maybe Sunday afternoon I'll have to find you in the press box and see if, <laughs> if that was indeed correct. But, again, a wonderful job here. I appreciate you always letting me come over and see the archives. The books were fantastic. Again, I, I can't recommend them enough. And uh, I will see you at the, at the Speedway, and thanks again for the time. My pleasure. My pleasure.